Morning, Carla Dunn. Good morning, Bob and Kim. Good morning, Janice. Good morning, David. Good morning, Richard. Good morning. Let's all stand together. It's so good to see all of you. And good morning to everyone that's watching on Facebook today. Uh, we're so glad you're tuned in as well. Um, we're going to begin with a great opening song. Sing along with us and uh, let's make this a great day in the world. Let it be your opening prayer as well. Sing along with us. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the people of God sing His praise all over the land. Everyone in this valley. He deserves our love. 
No. It's coming through. Whoop. There you go. Hey, there we are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, and it's good to see you today. And uh, I want to thank uh, the church for recognizing that uh, I've been here 10 years. I don't know how that happened. Thank Kevin for being mindful of that. It's uh, not the first church I've been at for 10 years, but it is the first church uh, that's recognized that. And I really, really appreciate that. Amen. Thank you so much. And all praise go to the Lord. Well, up behind me, you see a phrase. You see a phrase that's uh, been uh, in the news a lot the last four, five, six years. Fake news, fake news. You hear it all the time. You will be uh, probably relieved to know that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm talking about something even worse. Ah, fake good news. Amen. The good news, that comes from the word gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news in Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news. And unfortunately, and it's been that way down through the ages, there are many fake gospels. There are many fake good newses. That, that's a strange word to say the plural of, newses. There's, there are many fake good newses down through the ages. And I think we, we have one that's rather insidious today because the worst lies, they say, are the ones that are very close to the truth but harder to identify, especially those for those who don't know the truth well. And um, um, we might call it the social media gospel. Um, I don't mean that social media is the fault. It's not Facebook or Twitter's fault. That's just where it manifests itself. That's just where we see it. That's just where we realize that, wow, I thought that person was a little more grounded in Christ than that to say something like that. We find out all kinds of things about people there. But the social media gospel, you'll usually have a thread where it goes on and on and on. And um, somebody will say, that wasn't very Christ-like. And they'll say something like, well, Jesus was all about, and then they'll put in some word there, and Jesus wasn't all about what they say. They might say, Jesus was all about tolerance. You know, anything goes. Jesus was all about getting along with others. Jesus was all about kindness. I can't believe you'd say that. Jesus was all about accepting people. Jesus was all about, here it is, being nice. Some have, some have called this gospel this fake gospel that we're experiencing right now, the gospel of nice. The gospel of nice. It doesn't sound bad at first blush, does it? Christian writer Steve Ray says this, I wish I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, that was not very Christ-like. This response usually comes after being honest to the point of making someone upset or uncomfortable. The implication is that Jesus was this cuddly little nice guy who was always smiling, always accepting with kind words, in short, that he's nice. Now think about the word nice. I remember back in high school, we had yearbooks, and especially our senior year, I, I guess they still do this today, probably not this year, but, but um, people would uh, sign in something in your yearbook, you know, to remember them by. And you'd like to hear something like, uh, you were such a good friend, or, um, uh, you know, you, you, you always look good, every hair in place, or you're the most beautiful girl in our class, or something like that. And it seemed like the comment that you didn't like to get too much was, um, best wishes, you are nice. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Now, it's better than saying you're a mean, down, uh, mean low-life, dirty scoundrel, but it's just kind of flat, isn't it? You're, you're so nice. <laughs> Well, imagine Jesus hearing that about himself, and that's kind of it. He's nice. Nice guy. But let me ask you this. Does love equal nice? Not always. Of course, Jesus was loving, more loving than we can ever be. He is God, after all, and God is love, it tells us in 1 John. We know that love does not always equate to nice, however. God allowed Paul to have a thorn in his flesh to keep him humble. We read about that in 2 Corinthians. Three times Paul prayed to be for that to be removed. And God said no. He certainly wasn't being very nice about it, was he? There's such a thing as tough love. It is the kind of love that cares enough to be honest, to confront, to discipline, 
to cause temporary pain to bring about eternal glory. On the surface, tough love does not always appear to be very nice, however. How often as a child were you uh, sent to a corner or, or spanked back in the day? Um, remember a couple of those from Grandma uh, with a switch off the <laughs> cherry tree out there? Um, how many times did that happen to you and you said to that parent or that grandparent, you're not very nice. <laughs> Maybe your kids have said that to you. Maybe they even did earlier this morning. Love isn't always nice. Was Jesus nice? Well, C.S. Lewis in his great Chronicles of Narnia, those stories that are just wonderful if you haven't read those before, he metaphorically represents Christ as this great lion named Aslan or Aslan. Great, powerful, scary looking lion even. And in the first book of the series called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, a group of children are sort of magically transported to this land called Narnia. And on meeting Aslan, the lion, for the first time, one of the children, Susan, asks, is he, is he quite safe? They're British, so pardon my <laughs> attempt at it. But she says, is he quite safe? And one of the creatures there in Narnia answers back, safe? <laughs> Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. I think we could say the same thing about nice. Just like Aslan in Narnia, Jesus is approachable and loving, but don't ever consider him to be tame or too cuddly. Jesus is God, and basic biblical theology teaches that God is a God of wrath, and God is a God of grace at the same time. Imagine coming to the temple in Jerusalem to pray one day, and you hear this commotion, and you run over to see what's going on. And there's this angry young man throwing over tables and grabbing money from the merchants and throwing it on the ground. And then you see him fashion a whip out of some cords, and he actually strikes people with it. Now, I can just hear somebody on the Jerusalem Facebook group page say, well, that wasn't very Christian. <laughs> He's the essence of what being a Christian is. Is Jesus nice? No, not always according to that definition, but he is good. Watch out, my friends. For the gospel of nice, it will sneak up on you. Tony Agnesi writes, Quietly, a new religion has established itself in America, and most are unaware of what is happening right under their noses. It's called moralistic therapeutic deism. It's a hodgepodge of banal, self-serving, feel-good beliefs. It is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of nice. It is characterized by personal happiness, interpersonal, interpersonal pleasantries. It says God wants people to be good, nice, fair, tolerant of others. All those things sound good, but that's pretty much all it says. It says the central goal of life is to find your own personal happiness and to learn to feel good about yourself. The central goal in life. God is not involved unless you have a problem. And good people go to heaven when they die. Honestly, it seems more like a cult than the true gospel. C.S. Lewis. Catch this C.S. Lewis uh, comment here. I think we, do we have that? Yeah. C.S. Lewis wrote... And, and let this sink in. I had to read it kind of two times myself to, to get the full grasp of it. He said, a world of nice people, content in their own niceness, looking no further and turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world and might even be more difficult to save. Look at it again. A world of nice people, content in their own niceness, looking no further than that and turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation because they're still sinners, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world, even and perhaps even more difficult to save. We turn to God in the times of trial, not in the times of comfort quite often, sadly. The Gospel of Nice. Well, I found this on a, I think it was right there, I found this on a friend's Facebook page. It was this list of 10 things. Don't worry if you can't read it just yet. I'm going to go through each one of them, and we're going to do it rather quickly with most all of them. Um, and it was called um, uh, 10 Marks of the New Age Jesus. I think you could also call it 10 Marks, perhaps, of, except for the first one. You'll see in a minute. Uh, 10 Marks of the uh, 
social media um, Jesus, different than the real, true, historical Jesus of the Bible. Um, let's, let's just dive right into these. Number one, Jesus was conceived during the celebration of the fertility goddess Ishtar and born on Baal's birthday. You know what? That one is just so outrageous, and even though there are people that believe this stuff, we're not even going to spend any time on it. Let's go on to number two. I told you they'd be quick. You know, we need to tell you how to refute that. You can open up your Bible with ease. I, I bet everybody here just about could, could refute that first one right now with just what's in your head. Let's go on to number two. Now, this number two, this is one of these lies that's kind of close to the truth. So some would say, what are you talking about, Ken? I think that's what it's all about right there. Number two is that Jesus only promotes peace and opposes opposition. I put the only in there because I think that's the way it's intended to be uh, said. Jesus promotes peace and opposes opposition. Look at the two scriptures. A lot of times people will use these two scriptures and still, you know, when they try to say the Bible contradicts itself, it doesn't contradict itself. Uh, and not in this case, especially right here. They take two uh, sayings of Jesus, just four chapters apart, and try to say, look, he even Jesus contradicted himself. No, 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 no. On the one hand, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. That's from the Beatitudes there in chapter 5. Of blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called children of God. But this same Jesus in chapter 10, just a few chapters later, said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. What? Well, when you look into it deeper, when you look into it deeper, uh, you'll find the answer. Let's look at that passage there from Matthew 10, 34 through 38, a little closer. Um, Jesus says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his, her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be in the members of his own household, and anyone who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. By the way, you know that you'll love your son or daughter, your mother, father, whatever. You'll love them more if you love Jesus first than if you love them first and Jesus second. Yep, it's true. If you love them more than me, you're not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross, the cross there is a, a symbol of Death to self, self-denial. Anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I could spend a lot of time trying to explain this, but let me say it in a shorter way here, just taking the words from hard sayings of the Bible from Walter Kaiser. Listen to this carefully, how he, he, he explains this. When Jesus said that he had come to bring not peace, but a sword, he meant that this would be the effect of his coming, and not the purpose of his coming. What's the purpose of his coming? He tells us. He came to seek and save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That was his purpose. But his purpose in coming to do that, there would be an effect with some people sometimes. Let's read on. It was the effect of his coming, not the purpose of his coming. The metaphor of the sword describes how unbelievers may respond to the gospel. Not how we communicate it. Don't go wrong there. As children of God, or our purpose is to represent the Prince of Peace regardless of the effect it has on those around us, even close relatives. You just keep on keeping on doing what's right. Not like you're brandishing a sword. That's not what it's talking about. The sword will come from those who oppose. You keep on preaching the gospel in love in your actions, in your words, in your deeds. Jesus, the message of his gospel is not peace at all costs. You got that? Peace at all costs means other things have to be sacrificed. His message is not peace at all costs. Ronald Reagan took a, a Gandhi um, saying, and, um, well, hang on a minute. I got ahead of myself here. Um, the message of the gospel is not peace at all costs. Jesus says that being in peace, of, the peace of God will probably cost you something. And thirdly, if I can co-opt a phrase today, if there's no Jesus in your life, there will be 
no peace. Amen. Now under that Ronald Reagan quote, Jesus took a, or, uh, Ronald Reagan took a quote from Gandhi and changed it a little bit. And he said, peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. And then that great author, Anonymous, who's written so many good things, <laughs> he or she said, they took Ronald Reagan's phrase and turned it around a little differently. It said, peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the presence of God, no matter what the conflict. Let's move on to falsehood number three. Jesus promotes unconditional love and acceptance. Kind of sounds good, doesn't it? But be careful. Yes, God loves us unconditionally, but I hear so many people in this world today talk about the unconditional love of God in a way that they act as though it means you can, anything goes. You can do whatever. And yes, they're true. You can do whatever and God will still love you because God loves us because of who he is, not because of what we are. You got that? God loves us because of who he is and his nature, not because of who we are and what we do. Yes, God loves us unconditionally, but be careful the way you say that. He is not an anything goes kind of God. Right. Further, God asks us to love unconditionally, but he, he doesn't ask us to stamp our approval on anything. This is so difficult sometimes for people, and it's been difficult for me at times, where I love someone, but they're erring in their lifestyle and whatever they're doing in an attitude or whatever. And some people have to just draw lines like... Uh, they have to be just like me or, or I toss them away. That's not what we're called to do. But we're not called to say, you know, everything you do, I approve of it. They may demand that from you, but that's them drawing a line in the sand and not you. You be loving. God's love is unconditional, but it doesn't mean there aren't consequences for our actions. No one will be condemned without God loving them, even as he condemns them. Have you ever thought of that? They're not condemned because God doesn't love them. They're condemned because they have, they have chosen to not accept the love of God in Jesus Christ. And, and, and again, God asks us to unconditionally love, but doesn't, ask, doesn't want us to stamp our approval. In fact, many scriptures tell us not to do that. And keep this in mind, tolerance is not the same thing as acceptance. I think we're a slide ahead there. Tolerance is not the same thing as acceptance. True tolerance means we, it almost has the ring of put up with. We will tolerate, we'll allow someone to be around us, we'll even allow them to be our friend. But it doesn't mean we approve of what they do. Tolerance is not the same thing as acceptance. Yes, be tolerable, but you don't have to be accepting of sin. Not everyone, now that scripture, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Falsehood number four. Jesus uses smooth, politically correct, non-offensive, vague language. Let me ask you, have you ever read Matthew 23? Let's, uh, let's play a video clip. This may be a different Jesus than you're used to. But it's right out of Scripture. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools! Which is greater? The gold 
or the temple that makes the gold sacred. You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his own. You blind men, which is greater? The gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Woe to you! Teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guys! You stray out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee! First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, we're full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. But on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up them! The measure of the sin of your forefathers. You snakes! You brood of vipers! How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so, upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. Wow, politically correct. Now I want to speak to the more zealous among us here today. Do not go to Walmart later today, get my mind somebody and say, you hypocrite. Do not go to McDonald's later today. 
come up to a table of people and say, You snakes! You brood of vipers! <laughs> but it's a different Jesus than what the world would look at, isn't it? And some might even reject seeing that today because they haven't taken a deeper look into Jesus. Let's roll into number five quickly. Jesus calls everyone his children. Just quickly, look at this scripture, Matthew 7. Again, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles that I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Number six. Jesus does not require repentance, holiness, or even obedience. Look at John 13, 3. Jesus said, and you will perish too unless you repent of your sins Amen. and turn to God. And then a couple verses later, for more emphasis, he repeated it and said, and you will perish. Or I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. John the Baptist, although it isn't Jesus' words directly, Jesus did endorse John the Baptist's ministry, said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Number seven, Jesus judges no one. I've heard people say this so many times and seen it written in social media. Jesus doesn't judge anybody. It's just not true. More, look at this uh, from John chapter five, first verse 22. Moreover, the father judges no one. Why? Because he has entrusted all judgment on the son. Jesus. I'm not sure, but I think that has something to do with the Father saying the Son has been like one of them. The Son took on human form. The Son knows what it's like to be tempted. Therefore, I'm going to allow the Son to be the judge. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has gifted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Jesus judges no one. Have you read the book of Revelation? Falsehood number eight. This is a, a deadly one. Jesus wants you to pursue your own will. The world says, find yourself. You be you. Discover the real you and be happy. Be the best version of you that you can be. Jesus' best version of who you can be and the world's best version of who you can be are really two different things. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Let me say that again. If you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross. This is even before he died on the cross, he's saying this. Take up your cross. You're dead to yourself. You're crucifying yourself. You must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Look at this. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? But you yourself are lost or destroyed. Falsehood number nine, Jesus offers ideas and suggestions, not commands. Have you ever heard someone, I'm sure you have, you've ever heard someone say, um, let, let's go back and slide there for a second. You've ever heard someone say um, uh, some kind of statement, um, you know, like, uh, um, you're really ugly. I don't know, just think something really offensive. You're really ugly. And then they'll put on the end of it, just saying, just saying. <laughs> 
I think they do that because they think it somehow kind of softens what they said. You know, just saying, like, I might not really believe it, but just saying. I don't know of anywhere in Scripture where Jesus gave a command and he said, just saying. No, he said, verily, verily, I say unto you. He said, in other words, it's kind of our way of saying in modern day, uh, a word to the wise should be sufficient. I used to have a professor that would say that. A word to the wise is sufficient. There might be a quiz coming up. You can guarantee there's going to be a quiz the very next time we met. Let's go on to that, that next slide there. Look at these scriptures. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not kind of uh, lean toward ascribing to them and, and do your best. And, you know, um, uh, just kind of just say it. No, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Look at John 14, uh, 23. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them. And we will come into them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Matthew 19, there's only one, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And then from James, although again, it's not Jesus' direct words. It comes from James, who I believe was the brother of Jesus that authored the book of James. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Falsehood number 10, our last one. Jesus allows most everyone into heaven and only the worst go to hell. There's a lot of Christian authors, Christian authors, that will tell you this. There's a guy named Rob Bell that had a book that sold in the millions of copies that will tell you this kind of thing. That only the very worst, like the Hitlers, and some of them even say even the Hitlers will, will, will have a chance and, and accept Jesus and be saved. It's not what the Bible says, folks. As much as we might want it to, like St. Augustine said, you know, there's, there's a difference between what we'd like for the Bible to say and what it actually says. Do most people go to heaven? Let's look at Jesus' words again from the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7 of Matthew. Enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it the small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it again that scripture from Matthew 7 21 not everyone who says to me Lord Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven and they'll say did we not prophesy in your name did we not drive out demons in your name they'll tell them I never knew you away from me you evildoers Let's look at some suggestions on this 10. Just quickly go right through them here. First of all, get into the Word. Get into God's Word daily. The only way that you will sniff out some of these lies that are very close to the truth is to get into the real truth, the objective truth, the truth that doesn't change, the truth that is absolute, the Word of God. Get into the Word. Number two. Jesus was full of grace and truth, it tells us in John chapter 1. Let's try to be people who are full of both in equal Holy Spirit inspired measure. You can have a Christian who is full of truth. They know the Bible backwards, forwards, inside out, but they don't tend to have much or any grace. And it's a sad thing. It's a very sad thing. They're like the Pharisees that were presented earlier. Make it hard for people to get into the kingdom of heaven. Always pointing out others' faults and not looking at their own. Worried about that splinter in someone else's eye when they've got a big log sticking out of theirs. We need to be people of the truth, but it needs to be tempered with grace. And then there are other Christians who are full of grace, but they're really, um, they're really not so full of the truth. Hence the gospel of nice. Anything goes. Anything's okay. Let's be people of both grace and truth, okay. even as we try to be like Jesus. Number three, remember that your cheering section is in heaven. How encouraging is that? Look at 
Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Number four, never give up. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Number five, be of good cheer. You remember the old song that says, Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. Think about that. That's right out of Scripture from Romans 8. Joint heirs, co heirs with Jesus. Folks, that is amazing. It, when we accept Christ, we are grafted into the family of God. We become children of God. And the scripture tells us if we are children, then we also will be joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Wow! I don't deserve it, but wow! A co heir with Jesus in the family of God. Folks, there are many, many passages you can read. Be a good cheer. Jesus has overcome, and when you're in Jesus, you too are an overcomer. Ain't no coronavirus going to stop him. Amen. Be a good cheer. Six, speak the truth in love. I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, but speak the truth in love. Love, love, love. The gospel in a word is love, the old song said. People won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Don't wear the truth on your sleeve like the Pharisees wore those little boxes with Scripture tied to their head and tied to their arms. And they make them real big. And look at me. I carry the Word of God on my head. Don't wear it on your sleeve, as we would say today. If you have a friend that asks you, hey, I know you're a Christian. I know my lifestyle doesn't mesh with what you believe. Can we talk about that? You might ask them, why do you want to talk about it first? Maybe they're just trying to pin you down or find a reason to dislike you. You know, Jesus, Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine for some reason. But if it's because they say, because I'm scared, because I, I feel like I might be doing wrong, pursuing the best version of myself that I can. And you sit down with them and you talk with them and you tell them your story. You can do it. You can do it, Christian. If you love them, you can do it. Because loving them and say, ah, it's all right. Whatever you are, that's okay. I accept you. Yeah, we accept them, but we don't have to approve. Be salt and light in this world. Sometimes when we come out of the darkness, the light makes us do this, doesn't it? But after we get used to it, we realize the light's a good thing compared to the darkness. Speak the truth in love. And if you can't do it in love, you maybe ought to think about not speaking it. Lastly, the whole of the matter, here it is from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, from a very wise man who tried everything in life to see what purpose was. And he said, it all comes down to this, fear God, keep his commandments. Some people don't like that word, fear God. That's not the cuddly gospel of nice. But fear can be a good thing. Jesus said, don't fear this world, what people can do to you. They can only kill this body. Fear the one who can kill the body and put the soul in hell. Fear God, keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of man. Amen. There's fake, fake good news out there today, folks. Be careful of it. But there is also real good news. And you can say that two ways. You can say it's real as in it's not fake, the good news, that is the salvation in Jesus Christ. It's bona fide, real good news. You can also say it's real good, as in it's really, really good. It's a good thing. It's both. It's true, and it's the best thing that can ever happen to us. To be introduced to Jesus Christ, to take him as our Savior, to devote our lives to him, to turn away from the things of the world, to proclaim Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And I'll follow him, and yes, I'll follow him imperfectly, but his grace is sufficient for me. Folks, there's good news in Jesus Christ. You might say, man, Ken talked a whole lot about hell today. It's not pleasant, but I don't want to apologize for it. Because the one I hopefully stand here and represent today, he talked a lot about it too. 
Why? Because he loves you, because I love you. And beloved, I don't want to see you go there. I want to see you for eternity in heaven. I don't want to see you destroyed. I want to see you live forever. There is salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's the best news ever. It's not called the good news without a reason. Hallelujah. There is good news in Jesus Christ. We're going to sing a, a song of invitation. I have my, my friends come back up here. And maybe today you have a decision you need to make. Maybe you just have a prayer request or something. I encourage you to come forward. If you're listening out there on Facebook and um, some things you've heard today you're wondering about, I want to encourage you to contact me, contact someone. <coughs> Ask them about the good news that we can rejoice in, in Jesus Christ. It, it is wonderful news. You can have your sins forgiven. You can be washed clean. Stand before God. Justified. That word says justified. Some people have defined it just as if I never sinned. That's the miracle of the washing, cleansing, wonderful power of the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Won't you take them? Won't you accept them as yours today? Kevin will be down in front here, and if any of you have a need to come forward, won't you do that? Let's stand together. Let's sing. Oh. 
River Valley Christian Church is so blessed. If you agree with that, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Last Lord's Day, we got to hear from a preacher who served Christ 70 years, Norman Abel. He's here again today. Would you give him a hand? Amen. This Lord's Day, we got to hear, hear from a Ken Kiefer, who's been with us 10 years. And uh, in that 70-year affirmation of my dad, there was a slide that said he could not do those 70 years without his wife, Roberta Abel. I believe that's true, Ken. You couldn't do your 10 years here or any year before in ministry without your wife, Megan Kiefer. Amen. Would you give Megan a man for partnering in ministry? We love Amen. you both. Uh, next Lord's Day, we're excited, River Valley. We're so blessed we get to honor the two 2020 graduates, and we're excited about that number of young people who will be Woo! celebrating today that graduation milestone. And we'll come back next week to recognize them who've had a part in the ministry that we will commend them to their next phase of ministry in Christ's name. We are blessed here. You know, uh, I, I'm going to start a sermon series next week that is going to look at the book of, of Philippians, and uh, I there's a, a theme that I'm going to choose called Choose Joy. Two years ago, uh, my wife uh, um, was diagnosed with cancer. And that changed her world, my world, and uh, took us on a journey to have to figure out how to battle something that uh, only by God's grace you can get through. And what we learned in that journey was uh, you've got to not be happy about what's going on, but you have to choose joy that God is with you. And that's what we do in this season of the pandemic. We're not happy about what is going on in our lives. But we've got to choose joy that there's a God and through Christ, he will lead us through that journey. And it's amazing, two years later, we can have joy and happiness because of Christ. And that's what we're looking forward to. There's a lot of things we're not happy about. I, I got this note today from Mark and Deb Steinmetz. Kevin, would you ask uh, prayers for my niece, Alyssa? England. She's being deployed this week. For uh, or this week for Afghanistan for 120 days or more. Thank you, Mark and Deb's time next. I want you to pray for Alyssa England. She's worshipped here on different days in our 15 years of ministry. Her parents as well. And so I want you to pray for Alyssa as she is taking a deployment to a, a, a barren place. A hostile place. Some, some say they, they have had it. Uh, people who have put bounties on some of those soldiers in Afghanistan. But I want to remind you that we are here today to remember a Messiah who came to this world who was deployed for 33 years and he couldn't just exist being nice. He, he had to represent God and he, he had to choose joy in his journey as he worked and walked that barren land of Israel. There's a verse I believe is in Hebrew that says, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then shows the joy of heaven to get him through. Amen. I'm praying whatever challenge you have right now that you've come to church with, it's not a happy time for you, I'm sure. But remember, Christ is with you. God oversees you. God wants to get you through this with his help and a focus on Christ. I challenge you to not be happy, but choose joy and wait for joy to come in the morning through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some of you have had to go that path, and you now know that, that is possible. Would you encourage those who need that joy today? Let's choose joy. We'll learn more about it in the weeks to come. Father, River Valley Christian Church is so blessed. 
because you have uh, enabled us to, despite circumstances that aren't very happy, you have allowed us to choose joy and have a peace that passes understanding. Father, we thank you for Jesus who is our Messiah. We thank you for the one who arose from the grave. We thank you for the one who you sent to deploy uh, in this world uh, and was not treated well. Father, may we give you thanks as we observe the emblems uh, that are represented in our little cup today, in our cup that we have present for worship. And I hope you who are watching by Facebook, I, I pray you'll observe the Lord's Supper in quiet honor of the one who showed the ultimate love, for greater love is no one than this who laid down his life for us this day. Father, bless our servants of the Lord's Supper. May we choose joy in this moment. In Jesus' name I pray and all God's people say. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Observe the Lord's Supper where you are. <laughs> As I said earlier, River Valley Christian Church is really blessed in these days of the pandemic. This church family has kept the finances strong, and I give you thanks on behalf of our staff. I thank you for how we're able to continue to support our ministries and ministers who are away from the church, be they global in other lands or local in different parachurch organizations that we know are ministering in Christ's name nearby. Thank you for your generosity. And uh, if you are watching by Facebook Live, we need your support there. I thank you for you who are here today. Uh, thank you for your generosity. We want to continue to give the good news of Jesus Christ and the hope that was shared today. It's not fake news. It's real news. But it's the best news our world at this time needs. If you agree with that, would you say amen? Amen. Stand with me. We're going to have a closing prayer. And uh, I want you to sing the closing song with the team as we're done. Kevin, if I could interrupt real quick. You know, it dawned on me um, the other day that I have, it's been 35 years since I was ordained. Well, oh, that's a long time. And then it dawned on me right after that. That is only half of the time that Norman Abel has been in ministry. That's not <laughs> Let's give it a little thanks for that great Wow. As you can. I, I might add, last Sunday after church, uh, we went and ate with Dale Rorick, our custodian. And Dale heard Dad say that Noah preached 120 years. He said, Norman, you only got 50 more to go. <laughs> we all have a long time to be faithful. Let's be faithful together as the Church of God. Thank you for River Valley Christian Church staying strong. Father, bless our time, bless our ministry. Thank you that we get a chance to lift up your son. May those who are in this building today be uh, affirmed, comforted, encouraged. May those who are watching wherever they are today, may they hear Christ's word to them. In Jesus' name I pray his people say. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Yeah.